Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Mario Datillo from REA Group. Mario was born in Minnesota and currently resides in Florida. He has over 13 years of real estate investment experience. He was previously a managing partner of a real estate brokerage and currently holds a real estate broker license in the state of Florida. Mario has co-managed REA USA's residential, multifamily, and commercial real estate portfolios since inception. His current role includes oversight of acquisitions, investor relations, and the management of general operations. Mario relocated to Naples in 2011 and enjoys boating, traveling, and volunteering his time with various charitable organizations. Mario, welcome to the show. Thanks, Andrew. Really appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to be on this. I'm a big fan of the, the podcast, and so I appreciate the invite. I was excited to get that. Hey, we're happy to have you, man. I'm a big fan of your Facebook Lives, so uh, I took some tips from your last one. I, I appreciate you coming on. Mario, maybe you could start out by telling us you know, about your story and how you got into investing in manufactured housing communities. Sure. So back in, jump back to early 2000s, call it 2006 through eight. I had a good friend that I was in business with. We owned a real estate brokerage and a mortgage company. We were focused on residential real estate. We're doing a lot of distressed sales, foreclosures, short sales, things like that. And I was representing clients who were buying these properties. And I went to my dad and said, man, you've got all this construction background. That was his background, right? So he was a builder, a a contractor. um, I should say custom home builder, contractor, sold uh, commercial construction material. Just his old track record was construction. And I had the um, kind of acquisition disposition side pretty well dialed in. And so I went to him and said, why, why aren't we buying these? We're helping clients, you know, buy and sell these things. And so we did. And fast forward, we were buying and rehabbing homes in Minnesota, selling them off. And then in 2009, had the opportunity to invest with a friend uh, where we bought a bunch of new homes out of bankruptcy from a builder in Florida. And that kind of opened up the door to Florida to us. And expanded from there. In 2014 and 15, we decided that we wanted to get out of the single family business. Um, Although it had been very profitable, we recognized that the market was changing. There wasn't quite as much distressed property out there. And so we wanted to shift into more of a buy and hold investment strategy. And so we started looking at multifamily and apartment buildings. And we, we love apartment buildings, but Believe it or not, back in 2014 and 15, we thought we missed the window on pricing for apartment buildings. And so we, we stumbled across a mobile home park. And said, well, this kind of resembles an apartment building. Let's see what this thing is. And, and we bought it. And that was kind of the, the start of our mobile home park investing uh, career. Um, we've also bought a little bit of self-storage as well. And, and that was it. We, we really are focused on long-term investments and, and buying these assets for you know, the long haul 10 plus year investment strategy. Wow, that is very cool. So I think a lot of listeners really wish that they started buying real estate in 2009, 2010. You know, what can you tell us about the, the market at that time, you know, uh, you know, from experience, you know, being able to buy and I know it was single family, but that had to be an exciting time. Well, it was a bloodbath, Andrew. I mean, it was <laughs> Uh, Minnesota being Midwest market was bad. I mean, it was rough, but when we saw what Florida looked like, it was ground zero for just everything distressed. It was, you know, when we were buying homes, we drive down the the markets we were buying in were primarily Cape Coral, Lehigh Acres, a little bit in Fort Myers. And um, it was vacant homes everywhere. And the great, the crazy thing about these homes were, mostly brand new homes, new construction. There was so much, there was so much new construction homes to buy. It was, it was a great opportunity. And we were just kids in a candy store. (laughs) 
I bet. I bet. So why, why Florida? Was that just because the opportunity was in Florida? Just because, like you said, that was ground zero of, of a lot of, uh, you know, just vacant housing and, and a lot of foreclosures? Yeah, frankly, we weren't looking there. I, like I said, I was, we were buying in Minnesota. That was our backyard. We knew it well. And um, a friend had called me and said, look, I get this opportunity looking for some partners on it. Let's buy these homes. It was 21 homes, brand new construction homes out of bankruptcy from a builder. Wow. And that's got down here and looked around and said, wow, this is, this is crazy. Um, so that's, it was really, we stumbled on it and it was just a good opportunity to open the door. That is very cool. What can you tell us about that, that first park that you guys bought and maybe, you know, some of your differences uh, compared to the parks you buy today? So that community was a poster child of what we want to buy. It was full for the most part. There was only a few empty lots, very mismanaged. Real briefly on this is pretty neat. We bought the note on it. So a friend came to us and said, hey, look, this bank is, has this mortgage that's defaulted. It's this mobile home park right around the corner from you. <laughs> you want to take a look at it? So we're, we know notes. We understand, you know, buying debt, but we didn't understand the mobile home park business. And it was, it was managed by uh, a receiver. So the financials were super clean. And they, of course, the receiver was milking it for every dollar they could. They were pretty much feeing the property so much that it was breaking even. It was just very poorly managed. The owner had bought it for four and a half million bucks to redevelop it missed the market, tanked, and then they ended up owning it, didn't really ever intend to manage it. And so it was just a lot of good opportunity in it. And we ended up uh, bringing in some homes, build back water sewer, and uh, raised rents pretty aggressively, made it a nice community, did landscaping. And uh, it, was, it was a home run. We ended up going full cycle and selling that deal about a year and a half ago. And uh, we didn't want to sell it. But somebody came to us with an offer we just couldn't refuse. And it was, it was a phenomenal deal. That's so awesome. That is an amazing story. You know, most people on their first park, they, they wish they would have done something differently, you know, but that's fantastic that you guys were able to, you know, be so opportunistic. Uh, don't don't get me point. wrong. It, it didn't go perfect. I mean, there was a lot of surprises. Anybody who says that uh, any parks go exactly the way they planned probably, probably isn't telling the full story. We, we, we definitely ran into issues throughout it, but you know, we, we bought that and sold it for, you know, call it over six times what we bought it. Wow. For. That's um, fantastic, man. Business. And was that in Minnesota or was that down in Florida? Naples. Down in Naples. Wow. Yeah, it was right around the corner from our office. It was, it was just a great, great opportunity, great learning experience for us too. That's very cool. So how many parks do you guys own and manage today? We've bought 11 communities today. We own 10. That was the only community we've ever sold. We've been approached a lot to, to sell, as I'm sure you have, but uh, we, we try and hold on to them as long as we can. Sure. Uh, and we do own a little bit of self-storage, but our, our main focus is manufactured home communities. Okay. Oh, and, and we do own them and we do own them in Florida, throughout Florida, Georgia, the Atlanta market of Georgia. And then we've recently acquired a community in Minnesota. So going back to the roots, buying some things up in the Midwest, hopefully. There you go. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so how many lots is that? And about 800. Like your, about 800, okay. And what's your average uh, you know, number of lots per park? So our average is about so. 70. Yeah, about 80. 70. Okay. We have, our, our smallest community is, I wanna say about 40 lots, 38 lots. Uh, our largest is 120. Very and cool. We've got a couple, Two, uh, two, two of them in the hundred plus and the rest are kind of in that 60, 70 range. That's fantastic. With the ones you own in Florida, you know, when I speak with a lot of, you know, investors, they always ask about the hurricane risk and the tornado risk and what happens when this huge storm comes through and just wipes out the whole community. Maybe you could shed some light on, you know, what you guys have done to kind of uh, hedge against that risk. It is a little scary. I'm not going to lie. Even it, you can do all the things that you want, that you possibly can to protect yourself. But every time there's a hurricane heading towards Florida, we are definitely praying a little bit harder, yeah. um, but really, really because it is a distraction to daily operations. I mean, it, it does throw you off a little bit, um, but insurance is huge. Um, 
we're heavily insured and uh, both from both from a property um, liability and also loss of business uh, loss of business income. So like business interruption coverage, that's something that you need to have on any community that you own. And it's we we lost a self storage facility up in the Panhandle to Hurricane Michael about two years ago. It got completely wiped out. Oh, I mean, wow. I'm flattened, and they think a, a tornado hit it behind the hurricane. But business interruption was just a lifesaver. So we have been through a, a, a catastrophic event on a property, not a mobile home park and, um, and learned a lot from that. But um, in preparation for storms, we typically get in contact with our managers um, and we have an actual procedure that they need to follow. Um, there's communication with the residents. There's making sure that all the debris and things that could be sitting out are cleaned up or tied down. Um, the residents need to be out of the communities. We typically do a drive-through video of the community before um, and, uh, and, and really it's tying things down. And the great thing about Florida is you do have homes that a lot of homes are wind zone rated to two or three. So they are prepared a little bit more for the storms. Um, but we, thankfully we, we haven't lost any, we actually had hurricane Irma come through Naples when we still owned our community in Naples. And, it wasn't necessarily the wind or the rain, it was the trees that we were concerned about. And so we do trim up the trees, make sure that any loose branches or branches that are near homes, if we can, you know, if we can get those trimmed up before hurricane season, we wanna do that because those can be really the biggest risk. Thankfully in that community, we had, we lost probably 15 trees, 12, 15 trees, and they fell between homes in every situation. We didn't lose a single home, which was- You're praying a miracle. off, dude. <laughs> it was a miracle. It, it was a miracle, but um, and thankfully nobody got hurt. That was a bad That's storm. That's the big thing. Yeah, that was a that was I, a bad storm. I would say if you're investing passively too, Andrew, because I know a lot of your listeners are are more LP passive investors. I think that's a great question to ask a sponsor: is what are you doing to prepare for a catastrophic event? I mean, if you're buying in the Midwest, there's tornadoes. There's there uh, you know there are other catastrophic type weather and storms that can happen in all parts of the country. And they, you should be asking them what type of insurance do they have and what are they doing? Do they have a procedure in place for their community managers and for their tenants and residents in preparation for those things? I don't totally. think you can escape catastrophic events. You just need to do your best. Do your best. Yeah. Prepare for it. I like that. Mario, what other questions should you know, LPs ask operators before, you know, before doing a project with one? Sure. You know, I think the basis of investing it as an LP is you need to understand enough about the business to be dangerous. You, you need to be able to ask the right questions and listening to podcasts like this podcast and studying up, going to maybe even a mobile home university or something like that. Hop on bigger pockets and these other websites that you can learn so that when you start talking to an operator, you can tell whether they actually know what they're doing from experience or if they're textbook. So first thing I would do is make sure you study up. You should find someone that you trust. And trust is a difficult thing to um, build. And it takes some time. If someone is pushing you into an investment quickly, that should be a sign that they're having trouble raising capital. And I'm not saying that raising capital is always easy, but you need to look deeper into that. It, we've, we've built our relationships very slowly you know, uh, with our capital partners. And, and so really getting to the, know them personally too, understanding their, understanding their thought process, both on investing, but also their, their general life principles. And because you can be a good business person, but that doesn't mean you have integrity. That doesn't mean you have, that you're honest, that you won't look for ways to take advantage of situations and do the right thing. So getting to know them as a person and taking your time to make that investment, I would highly recommend. Also, you know, alignment of strategy and timelines. You know, it's, I think your podcast is great because you're in, interviewing all these different operators that have different strategies. Some people are, are wholesaling deals and doing short-term or even three to five-year investments. They run a fund or maybe they're long-term. I've heard a couple of your guests that are very long-term investors and they're built buying legacy assets. And, and so your strategy, both either value add or stabilized assets, and also the timelines. I mean, for us, we're 10 plus year investment. We're, we're looking at 
buying things that we can hold for a long time. So someone who is looking to invest for three to five years and constantly be turning their capital, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to have that partner because their timelines don't align. So really taking the time to invest, understand their investment strategy and their timelines is going to save you a lot of headaches in the long run. And then obviously, this isn't really tied to the sponsor, but if you are dabbling with the idea of investing in manufactured housing industry <clears throat> or still trying to pinpoint what asset type or property type you want to invest in, you should really be considering investing in a property type that aligns with where you believe the economy is going. And I'm not an economist. I, I, I can't predict where the economy is going to go, but I have a pretty good idea of what, you know, the direction I feel like it'll go. So you should be investing in that type of property type. If you feel like the economy is going to get really strong and, and explode, then you should probably be looking at, you know, class A type of luxury investments. If you think it's going to get tougher, you should probably be investing in assets that are going to do well in down economies, such as affordable housing. Maybe you can shed some light on that, you know, with uh, the you know, how, how you see the economy playing out and, and, you know, maybe also discuss kind of how you see mobile home parks, you know, playing that, uh, you know, playing in, in how you see the economy playing out. If I was an, if I said I was an economist, I'd be lying to you. Um, I, I can't predict actually. Um, we've typically gotten out earlier than later. Um, as I mentioned, 2015, we got out of the single family home business thinking that things were heated up. But yeah, you can't predict the economy. We've been very cautious and conservative. So we thought the single family home market was overheated back in 2015. We thought apartments were expensive and look at where we're at now. So I, I would say just be ultra conservative. We've had a great run in the economy for a very long time and what goes up must come down. And I've, I've heard, actually heard the opposite um, that it just, you know, for multiple reasons, it can continue to go up and it, it can for some period of time, an unpredictable period of time, but there will be a correction for one reason or another. And so for us, we're just, we're investing in assets that we think are going to outperform others in this in, in, in a down economy. And that's really why we got into mobile home parks was, we saw that historically they do very well um, when, when the economy is not doing well. When people are struggling financially, they're not buying luxury homes. They are not moving into luxury apartments. They're downsizing. They're finding ways to tighten up their expenses and you know, manage what they have. And so if anything, we expect more and more people to downgrade into quality, affordable housing. And that's what we're trying to offer people. Um, I would also look at our industry as a consolidating industry. Uh, we really like the fact that the sellers of our, the communities that we're buying have owned them for a very long time. There's a lot of upside on them. There's a lot of opportunity to add value, clean them up, make them better places for people to live. And in that, in that situation, there's also the opportunity to generate a lot of revenue and also a lot of uh, capital gains on, on, on those properties. So over the next several years, you're going to see consolidation happening. We've already started seeing, you know, we've got multiple REITs in the industry now. We've got a lot of private equity that's larger private equity that's jumped in. And um, I think that's going to continue. It does bring a lot of legitimacy to our industry. And it's going to only, I, I think, pick up faster and faster. Now, with that, becomes it becomes more and more difficult to buy. Even when we started buying communities in 2015, we've seen just a massive increase. I'd say probably in the last 24 months, just tons of people getting out of other property types and looking for yields. So they're running to the mobile home park space. And so prices have gotten more and more difficult to, to, uh, to make work. So it's very competitive. Yeah, I agree. I attended the, uh, the J Scott Shields commercial academy and, and diamond inner circle, uh, you know, little kind of meeting, you know, seminar. And, you know, he's, he's been in commercial real estate quite a while. And he said uh, that 
you know, now's the time to sell. If you're ever going to sell one of these mobile home parks, the, you know, the pricing is at like 50 year high. Uh, so it was pretty, pretty interesting to hear that, but you know, with a, a strategy like yours, you know, the buy and hold long-term, uh, weather the storm, I think that, uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, we fully predict, and I mean, to cut you out, we fully predict a, a down economy and, and that, and that might also mean that financing gets more challenging to obtain, which means that may even commercial real estate, manufactured home communities may become a little bit less liquid in the, in the coming years. And, and with a longer investment view, we're, we're fully prepared to weather that storm. And we think there's going to be some great opportunities to buy. I would say that there's definitely some people who are buying mobile home parks that maybe underestimate the operational complications that, that come with it and are probably buying more than what they can handle. And there might be some opportunities. We've actually bought one community, great guy, but he bought it, realized, hey, this is not the property type I thought it was and got out of it pretty quick. And um, I think we're going to see more of that coming up. So um, stronger operators, people who have the, the, the liquidity and equity to go out and, and the track record are still going to be able to have access to capital and uh, even some debt with a strong track record. They'll still be able to get the debt needed. If, um, in those tougher times for financing. Yeah, I think that's going to be key. You know, what what does the financing environment look like? And I mean, even during COVID, it was it was pretty eerie when, you know, we, we had a, a deal under contract that we were trying to get financed. And it was like, oh, we, we've paused our financing for 90 days until further notice, so, you know, with, with several banks. So it's, uh, it, it's definitely something you want to make sure you're liquid. And that's what, you know, Scott Shields mentioned. He's like, it's definitely a time to get liquid right now because he thinks the same thing that, you know, as the economy goes down, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities. Um, totally maybe agree. Mario, you could shed some light on how you guys manage these assets. You know, like you mentioned, operations is, is not passive, right? You know, owning one of these assets is very involved and, you know, maybe you guys can share, uh, you know, how you guys manage these and what your team looks like. I envy our capital partners because they definitely have the benefit of watching what we're doing <laughs> and hearing about what we're doing, but not actually doing it. And that's, that's a great position for them to be in. And I've heard a lot of people talk about the manufactured home communities, mobile home parks as being, you know, cash cows, turnkey. And there is, when a property gets stabilized, they get pretty boring. And that's what we want. We want boring properties, right? Um, but typically, there's a lot of turnaround. There's a lot of, uh, in, in what we're buying at least, there's a lot of um, complexities in, in the operations. We, we self-manage. We started out um, with a third-party manager and great guy. Um, but as we started to grow our business, we realized, hey, we don't really know if there's a problem until it's too late, um, where mm. if we're running it, then... E there's still problems. I mean, as you know, there's surprises every day in this in, in this business, but at least we know about them and we can pinpoint the problem and, and work to solve it. And so we started a management company about two and a half years ago, um, brought on a great guy to run that company. And, um, and so we, we, we manage internally. I would say management, property management side of it, the home sales and infill, those are probably the most complicated parts of the business because we've got this hybrid property type, right? So we're in the rental business. So we're collecting lot rents, but then we have the sale aspect and then there's de the dealership license and there's certain regulations with that. And then even with financing those homes. And so you're not only looking for residents who can pay lot rent, but they also need to be able to buy the home with a certain down payment. And they have to have that ownership mentality where they're going to show pride of ownership. So there's just kind of a lot of different angles to it. And it's almost when pre-call, we were talking briefly and I said, you said, what's the, we, we talked about the different companies and different entities that we have. We've got four. We've got our investment company, Real Estate Acquisitions USA. We've got our dealership entity, React One. We've got the REA group, which is really our acquisition division. And we've got, um, REA management, which is our management company. So we've got these different businesses all just to operate this one community and they all have, you know, legal 
is, you know, issues you got to deal with financing, you know, um, in addition to the buying the community and doing the improvements there and the capital that's required there, you also have these capital drains with bringing in new homes and the setup costs. There's just a lot of different aspects to the business. And I'd be lying to you if we had it all perfectly figured out. We are constantly learning and trying to improve on what we're doing and learning from guys like you and other guys. Oh, we're, and, and girls we're learning too, man. Yeah, yes. no, they, I think it's an ongoing process. And, you know, uh, one of our deals was, you know, it's tax time, you know, as, as we're recording this, it's, it's March 30th. And, you know, we're trying to get the K-1s out before the end of the month here. And, you know, there's, there's complexities on the bookkeeping side of this business as well, right? Because, you know, like you mentioned, there's the, the homes, right? The home sales and the, the home expense in that separate entity, other than your management entity, other than your real estate owning entity. So it's, you know, there's just complexities to it that you don't think about when you're like, oh, we're, we're going to go buy this mobile home community and collect lot rent and it's going to be easy. No, it's, there's, there's a lot more to it. The accounting aspect is complex. We actually hired an in-house accountant um, versus Smart. having a, a third-party contracted accountant just because it is, it's, it's so high touch. I mean, like what you just said, you buy a home. Well, there's some accounting complexities with that. <laughs> then you fix it up. Well, that's also complex. Then you sell, but then there's some fine. I mean, yeah. And there's, it's so high touch with the accountant and trying to explain yeah. what's a Calculating what, what the is, basis of each lot, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. Sure. So we're on the same page there, but yeah. I, I do think that managing in-house is the way to go. And after interviewing several operators, you know, I think that, you know, most of them, I, I, I think about 90% of them are managing in-house, uh, which I think is a little bit of a nuance to this industry. And I had an opportunity to speak to a group of investors recently, and I was, you know, communicating like the, you know, the, the split structure. And they were mainly used to like multifamily deals where the operators, uh, you know, maybe get like a, you know, it's like a 2080 type of split where the, the GP will take 20% and the LPs will you know be in a pool of 80%. And I told them, you know, the typical mobile home park splits are, are a lot different than that, right? And the GPs are able to, to get more because again, it's very involved, it's very hands-on, it's more of an operating business where multifamily operators, you know, most of them can hire a local property management company to take the, you know, take the, the apartment complex and, and manage it uh, for a decent price and do a decent job. So it definitely is, is different in that aspect. It, it, it's, it's really a blend between, if somebody were to ask me, how, how would you describe or what, how does the mobile home park world work? How does the industry work? I would call it a for-profit homeowners association blended <laughs> with a, a with a builder. I mean, uh, you're you're basically bringing in homes and doing that home sales side. So you're almost like a developer builder, but then you're also kind of like a, a homeowners association. You may not own most of the homes, but you got to enforce rules. You got to you know maintain yeah. the common areas. So it's kind of a blend of those two businesses. It's very interesting, in right? Because imagine trying to hire someone that you know, can run an HOA, but also knows construction. It's, 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 it's very difficult to, to have that overlap. So. And- <laughs> yeah, Agreed. there's a lot of complexities. Mario, tell us, are you, do you guys have a fund, an investment fund, or are you doing syndications on your acquisitions? Yeah, great question. We, we independently sponsor each one of our deals. Our offerings are 506C offerings. And, um, and uh, we only have about five partners. And they've thankfully been very, very scalable. Um, they're very much in tune with what we're doing, and we've got a great working relationship. Um, even though they're, even though they're basically passive partners, uh, we involve them and 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 get their input on things and really listen to what what they think. I mean, we're for example, we're implementing something new in our business coming up here soon, and I met with each one of them and said, "Hey, look, you're going to be directly impacted by this," and so. We want to talk this through. What ideas do you have? So regardless of their their, their voting authority or, or, or even their control, we, we still really want to hear what they think because they've got great ideas. They're great business people and they've invested a lot of capital with us and they trust us. And so they, they are technically syndications, but we, we're, we try and keep our, in, uh, our group of partners relatively small. As you know, 
the the capital raising business is a totally separate business. So now <laughs> everything we just talked about, throw in another aspect oh, of man, raising yeah. capital. And so we try and avoid doing any type of capital raising campaigns or anything like that. So we've really been blessed with good people as partners that are scalable so we can keep growing without having to go out to market and, and find more partners. So that's, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, raising capital for a deal, you know, marketing, talking with each of them, uh, it, it just takes a lot of time. And, and that's what I was reading your bio. I saw that you do acquisitions, investor relations, and then you also do the operations. I was like, well, that's three positions in one. So I totally relate to you because I do the same thing. Sometimes I have to be the janitor and I have to clean up the office. Sometimes I'm, you know, raising capital for a deal. And, and sometimes I'm under a mobile home, you know, changing out the, the ball valve uh, on a water riser. It just you have many hats in a, in a small business, right? It really is. My whole goal this year, and not to get off track, is to become unnecessary in my business. So we've, we do have a really great team of people, both in the field and in our corporate office. And um, I, te- temporarily, I am sitting in a couple different seats, but um, I will be rehiring somebody for, to run our management company again, so that thankfully I, I can go back to focusing on the investment side. But it is, it is, uh, it really takes good people. And yeah. like you said, it often it's wearing multiple hats as you grow. We're, we're in that like weird space where we're too big to do it on our own, but too small to really staff up fully without going, yeah. you know, you get it. So totally. We should talk later. Cause one thing we did is we were able to bring in some, some VAs for like, you know, certain silos of tasks. And that's been, mm-hmm been huge to help out with with some different things on the management side yeah, uh last question that. for you mario because we're running a little long i wanted to ask you know what is the most important thing if you were going to tell an, a passive investor one thing uh what is the most important thing they need to know about our asset class mobile home parks uh, before making their first investment it's a great question the most important thing that they need to know is the complexities and that there's great returns in the business. You can earn great returns, but you know, people ask me a lot, a lot, you know, Oh, wow. I've heard those are great cash cows or, or they're a great investment. They say it about self storage too, right? (laughs) So they're a great investment at the right price. Right. So um, I, I think there's, there are a lot of investors overpaying for property right now um, where I, I just can't understand how they're paying those prices. And maybe they've got the secret sauce that I just haven't figured out, or they're just being ultra aggressive. And if you're passively investing with someone, understand that um, a business plan is great. Not everything always goes perfect. Um, and so you, you may have a great business plan, but if you're overpaying by that much where you just can't correct it, if things don't go perfect, you're probably going to get hurt. And so just be careful about the prices that the sponsor or sponsors are paying. And infill is very challenging. So if they're buying something on a very large infill performa, just be careful with that. That's, that's great advice. You know, I think, uh, you know, I, I read this in one of the books I was reading. I said, a good operator can make a bad deal good and a bad operator can make a good deal bad. So I think 100%. it's it's important to look at the full picture as well. Pay the um, right price too. In the right price, uh, of course. Uh, well, Mario, how can our listeners get a hold of you if they'd like to do so? I think the best, most interactive way would be to connect with me on Facebook. That's where I try and put out a little bit of content and connect with people most aggressively. LinkedIn as well. Um, you can also check out our website, uh, realestateacq.com. And uh, you can learn a little bit more about our investment company and, and uh, hope to connect with a lot of viewers. And I hope that we were able to add some value to them. And it's been a great conversation with you, Andrew. Yeah, great speaking with you as well, Mario. I uh, really look forward to continuing our relationship and talking more about you know, different operations and management ideas and, and strategies. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on the show and, and taking the time to speak with our listeners. Thanks again. It's been real fun. Awesome. That's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Would you like to see Mobile Home Park value add projects in progress? If so, follow us on Instagram at Passive MHP Investing for photos and awesome videos 
from our recent mobile home park acquisitions. Once again, that's at Passive MHP Investing on Instagram. See you there.